Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. Uh, we're going to be looking at a book by B.B. Warfield on an introduction to textual criticism of the New Testament. And I hope this is going to be a blessing to you and a help to you in the issue of textual criticism. This is a, a classic text uh, and uh, hope you enjoy. So I'm reading from uh, the text of B.B. Warfield. It's in the public domain. And I hope that you enjoy this. He writes, the word text properly denotes a literary work conceived of as a mere thing, as a texture woven of words instead of threads. It designates neither one side, the book which contains the text, nor the other side, the sense which the text conveys. It is not the matter of the discourse, nor the manner of it, whether logical, rhetorical, or grammatical. It's simply the word of words itself. It is with this understanding that the text of any work is concisely defined as a pisma or verba of that work. The word which came into the middle of English and from the French where it stands as the descent descendant of the Latin word textum retains in English the figurative sense of its primitive yet owes it to its origin that it describes a composition as woven thing as a curiosity interwoven, clothed or tissued of words. Once a part of the English language, it has grown with the, that tongue and has acquired certain special usages. We usually need to speak of the exact words of an author only in contrast with something else, and thus text has come to designate a composition upon which a commentary has been written, so that it distinguishes the words commented on from the comments that have been added. Thus we speak of the text of the Talmud as lost in the comment, and thus too, by any extreme extension, we speak of the text of a sermon, meaning not the epissima verba of the sermon, but the little piece of the original author on which the sermon professes to be a comment. By a somewhat similar extension, we speak of text of scripture, meaning not various editions of it, epissima verba, but brief extracts from scripture as for example proof texts and the like, a usage which appears to have grown up under the conception that all developed theology is of the nature of a common scripture. Such secondary senses of the word need not disturb us here. They are natural developments out of the ground meaning as applied to special cases. We are to use the word in its general and original sense which designates the epistema verba, the woven web of words which constitute the concrete thing of which a book is made, a work but which has nothing directly to do with the sense, correctness or the value of the work. There is an important distinction however which we should grasp at the outset between the text of a document and the text of a work. A document can have but one text, its epistema verba or its epistemae verba, and there is something further to say about it. But a work which may exist in several copies, each of which has its own epistema verba, which may or may not tally with one another. The text of any copy of Shakespeare that is placed in my hands is plainly before me. But the text of Shakespeare is a different matter. No two copies of Shakespeare, or now since we have to reckon with the printing press, we must rather say no two editions are precisely the same text. There are all kinds of causes that work differences, badness of copy, carelessness of compositors, folly of editors, imperfections of evidence, frailty of humanity. We know that the text of Kyle Halt's Helmet is BNT. What is the text of Hamlet 1? We cannot choose any one edition and say that it is the text of Hamlet. It is the text of Hamlet, but not necessarily the text of Hamlet. We cannot choose one manuscript of Homer and say that it is the text of Homer. It is a text of Homer, but the text of Homer may be something very different. We know then that the text of a document and the text of a TV work may be very different matter. The text of a document is the epistema verba, that document, and is to be had by simply looking at it. Whatever stands actually written in its text, the text of a work, again, is the epistema verba of that work, but it cannot be obtained by simply looking at it. We cannot look at the work but only at the documents of copies that represent it and what stands written in them individually or even collectively may not be the epistema verba of the work. 
by exactly the amount in each case in which it is altered or corrupted from what the author intended to write is not the epistema verba of the work. If then the text of a document or copy of any work is the epistema verba of that document or copy, the text of the work is what ought to be the epistema verba of all documents or copies that process, profess to represent it. It is the original, or better still, the intended epistema verba of the author. It may not lie in the document before us or any document. All existing documents take collectively may fail to contain it. It may never have. Perfect and pure may never have been laid perfect and pure in any document, but if an element of id idility thus attaches to it, it is nonetheless a very real thing and a very legitimate object of search. It is impossible, no doubt, to avoid a certain looseness of speech by which we say of example. The text of Nonius is in very bad state, and thus identify the text of a work with some transitory state of it, or it may be with a permanent loss of it. What we mean is that the text in this or that document or edition, or in all existing documents or editions, is a very bad and corrupt representation of the text of Nonius. It is not the text of Nonius at all, in fact, but departs from and fails to be that in many particulars. The text of Nonius, in a word, is just what we have not and are in search of. It is clear that the text of a work as distinguished from a text of a document can be had only through a critical process. What is necessary for obtaining it is a critical examination of the text of the various documents that lie before us as its representative, with a view to discovery from them whether and wherein it has become corrupted, and approving them to preser preserve it or else restoring it from their corruptions to its originally intended form. This is what is meant by a textual criticism which may be defined as the careful critical examination of a text with a view to discovering its condition in order that we may test its correctness on the other hand and on the other amend its errors. Obviously this is not a bold and unsafe kind of work, yet one sufficiently nice to engage our best powers. It is not, however, sought and wanton a procedure as it may seem at first sight and more of us than suspected are engaged in it daily. Whenever, for instance, we make a correction in the margin of a book, we chance to be reading because we observed a misplaced letter or a misspelled word or any other obvious typo typological error, we are engaging in a process of textual criticism. Or perhaps we receive a letter from a friend, read it carefully, suddenly come up with a sentence that puzzles us, observe it most closely and say, oh, I see a word has been left out here. There is no one of us who has not had this experience or who has not supplied the word which they determined to be needed and gone unsatisfied. Let us make, uh, take an opposite example or two from the printed books. When we read in Archdeacon Farrer's The Message of the Books, page 145, that God chose his own fit instrument for writing the books of the New Testament and that the sacred dues of the book was due to prior position of these writers, it's clear from the fact that only four of the writers were apostles. Few of us will hesitate to insert not before due, the lack of which throws the sentence into logical confusion. So when we read in the admirable international revision commentary of John's Gospel by Drs. Milligan and Moulton, page 341, yet we should overlook the immediate reference. The context tells us at once that a not has been omitted before overlook in an edition of King James Bible printed by Barker and Bill in 1631, men read the seventh commandment, thou shall commit adultery. Not without perceiving, we may be sure that a knot had fallen out and mentally replacing it all the more emphatically that it was not there. But all this is textual criticism of the highest and most delicate kind. We have in each case examined the text before it was critically determined that it was in error and restored the originally intended text by a critical process. Yet we do all this confidently with no feeling that we are trenching on learned ground and with results that are entirely satisfactory to ourselves and on which we are willing to act in business or social life. The cases that have been adduced involved, indeed the very nicest and most uncertain of the critical processes, they are all samples of what is called conjectural emendation. The text has been amended in each case by pure conjecture, the context alone hinting that it was in error or suggesting the remedy. 
The dangers that attend the careless or uninstructed use of so delicate an instrument are well illustrated by a delightful story which Mr. Frederick Harrison attributed to Mr. Andrew Lang of a printer who found in his copy some references to the scapping of Pocolin. The printer was not a pedant, Moller he knew, but who was Pocolin? At last a bright idea struck his invented mind and he printed it, the scapping of Sorry about this. Um, something there. Uh, something uh, <coughs> happened to my computer there. Sorry about that. I just lost everything for a second. Um, in this higher way, every reader of books is a textual critic in a lower way. Every proofreader is a textual critic for the correction of a text that lies before him by the readings of another give him as a model is simply the lowest variety of this art. The art of textual criticism is thus seen to be the art of detecting and mending errors in documents. The science is the orderly discussion and systemization of the principles on which this art to proceed. The inference lies very close from which from what has been said that the sphere of the legitimate application of textual criticism is circumscribed only by the bounds of written matter, such as the limitations of human powers in reproducing writing that apparently no lengthy writing can be duplicated without error. Nay, such are the limitations of human powers of attention that probably a few manuscripts of any extent are written correctly at first hand. The author, the author himself fails to put correctly on paper the words that lie in his mind, and even when the document that lies before us is written with absolutely exact correctness, it requires the application of textual criticism, i.e. a careful critical examination, to discover and certify this fact. Let us repeat it then. Wherever written matter exists, textual criticism is not only a legitimate but an unavoidable task. When the writing is important, such as a deed or a will or a charter or the Bible, it is an indefensible duty. No doubt differences may exist between writings in the nature of the conditions under which they were produced or transmitted, which may be demand for them somewhat different treatments. The conditions under which a work is transmitted by a printing press differ materially from those under which one is transmitted by a hand copy. And the practice of textual criticism may be affected by this difference. One work may lie before us in a single copy, another in a thousand copies and differences may, differences may then arise in the process of criticism that are applicable to, applicable to them. But all writings have this in common. They are all open to criticism and are all to be criticised and autograph writing is open to criticism 
and we must examine it to see whether the writer's hand has been faultless handmade to his thought and to correct his erroneous writing of what he intended a printed work is open to criticism we must examine it to see what of the aimless alterations that has been wrought by a compositor's nimble but not infallible fingers and what of the foolish alterations which the semi-unconscious working of his mind has inserted into his copy the proof reader has allowed to stand a writing propagated by manuscript is especially open to criticism here so many varying minds and so many varying hands have repeated each predecessor's errors and invented new ones that criticism must stick feated strata of corruption on corruption before it can reach the bedrock of truth. Nor is the arc a wide one, though which even the process of criticism which are applicable to these various kinds of writings can liberate. The existence of corruption in a writing can be suggested to us by only two kinds of evidence. One of these illustrated by a detection of misprints in the, bio, in the books we read or of the errors in the letters we receive. The most prominent form of it is the evidence of the context of general sense. To this is to be added, as of some, the same generic kind, the evidence of the style, vocabulary or usage of the author or the time in which he wrote and the like. All the evidence in a word that arises from the consideration of what the author is likely to have written. The name what is given to this is internal evidence, and it is the only kind of evidence that is available for an autographic writing or any other that exists only in a single. But if two or more copies extant, another kind of evidence becomes available. We may compare the copies together, and where they differ, one or the other testimony is certainly at fault, and critical examination and reconstruction necessary. This is external evidence when we proceed but the detection of the error to its correction we remain dependent on these same two kinds of evidence internal and external but internal evidence splits here into two well marked and independent varieties much to our help we may appeal to the evidence of the context or other considerations that rest on the question what is the author likely to have written to suggest to us what ought to stand in the place where a corruption is suspected or known now, this is called intrinsic internal evidence or we may appeal to the fortunes of reproduction, to the known habits of stone cutters, copyists, or composers, to suggest what the reading or readings known or suspected to be. Corruptions may have grown out of, or what reading on the supposition of its originality we count best for the origin of all others. And this is called transcriptural internal evidence. On the other hand, we may collate all known copies and appeal to the evidence that a great majority of them have one reading and only a few others or all the good and careful ones have won and all the bad the others all or several derived from independent sources have won and one such as can be shown to come from a single fountain have others and so marshal the external evidence if we allow for their broad and inadequate statement proper to this summary treatment we may, e we may easy that it matters not whether the writing before us be a letter for a friend or an inscription from a uh, Karchemish or a copy of, of a morning newspaper or Shakespeare or Homer or the Bible. These and only these are the kinds of evidence applicable. And so far as they are applicable, valid, it would be absurd to s apply them to Homer and refuse to apply them to Herodotus, to apply them to Nonius whose text is proverbially corrupt and refuse to apply them to the New Testament, the text of which is incomparably correct. It is by their application alone that we know what is corrupt and what is correct, and if it is right to apply them to a secular book, it is right to apply them to a secular one. Nay, it is not it is wrong not to not to. It is clear how moreover that the duty of applying textual criticism, say for instance to the New Testament, is entirely independent of a number of errors in its ordinary current text which criticism may be expected to detect. It is as important to certify ourselves of the correctness of our text as it is to correct it for if erroneous and the former is as much the function of criticism as the later. Nor is textual error to be thought to be commensurable with error in a sense. The text conveys the sense but the textual critic has nothing to do primarily with the sense it is for him to restore the text and for the interpreter who follows him to read the new meaning. Divergences which leave the sense wholly unaffected may be to him very substantial errors. It is even possible 
that they might find a copy painfully corrupt from which nevertheless precisely the same sense flows as if it had been written with perfect accuracy. It is of the deepest interest nevertheless to inquire even with this purely textual meaning how much correction the text of the New Testament in general circulation need before they are restored substantially to their original form. The reply necessary vary according to the standard of comparison which we assume. If we take an ordinary well printed book as a standard the New Testament in its commonly current text will appear sorely corrupt. This is due to the different conditions under which an ancient and a modern book come before a modern audience. The repeated proof corrected by readers and author alike in a modern printing office as primarily to the issue of a single copy, the ability to issue of thousands of identical copies from the same plates, the opportunities given to correct the plates for new issues so that each new issue is sure to be an improvement on the last all this conspires to the attainment of a very high degree of accuracy. But in ancient times, each copy was slowly and painfully made. Independently of all others, each copy necessarily introduced its own special errors. Besides repeating those of its predecessors, each fresh copy that was called for, instead of being struck off from the old and now nearly corrected place, was made laboriously and erroneously from the previous one, and perpetuating its errors old and new, and introducing still newer ones of its own, manufactured. A long line of ancestry gradually grows up behind each copy in such circumstances and the race gradually but inevitably degenerates until after a thousand years or so the number of fixed errors becomes considerable when at last the printing press is invented and the work put through it not the author's autograph but the latest manuscript is printer's copy and no other eye can overlook the sheets. The best the press can do is measurably to stop the growth of corruption and faithfully to perpetuate all that has already grown. No wonder that the current New Testament text must be adjudged in comparison with well-printed modern book, extremely corrupt. On the other hand, if we compare the present state of the New Testament text with that of any other ancient writing, we must render the opposite verdict and declare it to be marvellously correct, such as being the care with which the New Testament has been copied, a care which has doubtless grown out of true reverence for its holy words, such as being the providence of God in preserving for his church in each and every age a competent exact text of the scriptures, that not only is the New Testament unrivaled among ancient writings in the purity of its text, as actually transmitted and kept in use, but also in the abundance of testimony which has come down to us for all casting its comparatively infrequent blemishes. The divergence of its current text from the autograph may shock a modern printer of modern books, its wonderful approximation to its autograph is the undisguised envy of every modern reader of ancient books. When we attempt to state the amount of corruption which the New Testament has suffered in its transmission through two millennia, absolutely instead of thus relatively, we reach scarcely more intelligible, intelligible results. Roughly speaking, there have been counted in it some hundred and 80, 200,000 various readings, that is actual variants of readings in existing documents. These are of course the result of corruption, hence the measurement of corruption, but we must guard against being misled by this very misleading statement. It is not meant that there are nearly 200,000 places in the New Testament where various readings occur, but only that there are nearly 200,000 very readings all told. And in many cases, the documents so differ among themselves that many are counted on a single word. For each document is compared in turn with one standard, and the number of its divergent ascertained, then these sums are themselves added together. And the result gives us the number of actually observed variants. It is obvious that each place where a variant occurs is counted as many times over, not only as distinct variations occur upon it, but also as the same variant occurs in different manuscripts. This sum includes, moreover, all variations of all kinds and in all sources, even those that are singular to a single document in infinite, infinite testimonial weight as a witness, and even those that affect such a very minor matters as the spelling of a word. Dr. Ezra Abbott was accustomed to say that about 90, 20, 19, about 19 twentieths of them have so little support that although they are readings, no one would think of them as rival readings. And 1920s of the remainder are so little importance that their adoption or rejection would cause no appreciative difference in the sense of the passage where they occur. Dr. Hort's way of stating it is that upon 
about one word in every eight various readings exists supported by sufficient evidence to bid us pause and look at it that about one word in sixty has various reasons upon it supported by such evidence as to render our decision nice and difficult but that so many of these variants are trivial that only one, about one in every thousand is upon it substantial variation supported by such evidence as to call out the effort of the critics in deciding between the readings. The great mass of the New Testament, in other words, has been transmitted to us with no or next to no variation, and even the most corrupt form in which it has ever appeared to us, the often quoted of Richard Bentley, the real text of the Sacreds, is com competently exact, nor is one article of faith or moral precept either perverted or lost. Choose it awkwardly as you will, choose the worst by design out of the whole lump of readings, if then we undertake the textual criticism of the New Testament under a sense of duty, we may bring it to it to conclusion under the inspiration of hope. The autographic text of the New Testament is distinctly within the reach of criticism, in so immensely the greater part of the volume, that we cannot despair of restoring to ourselves the Church of God. His book, word for word, by inspiration to men, the following pages are intended as a primary guide to students making their first acquaintance with the art of textual criticism. So um, we're going to go on now to that was the preface. Okay, uh, the matter of criticism. First duty of the students who is seeking the true text of the New Testament is obviously to collect and examine the witness of that text. Whatever professes to be the Greek New Testament is a witness to its text. Thus we observe that copies of the Greek Testament are our primary witness to this text. The first duty of the textual critic, therefore, to collect the copies of the Greek Testament and comparing them together, pull from them all the various readings. He will not only acquire in this way knowledge of the variations that actually exist but also bring together by noting the copies that support each other's reading the testimony for each and putting himself in a position to arrive at an intelligent conclusion as to the best attested text it is obvious that no external circumstances such as the form of the volume in which it is preserved or the mechanical process by which it is made whether by printing or by hand or copying will affect the witness bearing of a copy to the text it professes to represent. Printed copies of the New Testament are per se as valid witnesses to its text as manuscripts, and had we no manuscripts we should not despair of attaining a good text from printed copies of the alone. Nevertheless, the universal consent by which printed copies are set aside and manuscripts alone used as a witness rests on sound reason. The first printed Greek Testament was completed in 1514, and hence all printed copies are comparatively late copies and therefore presumably inferior as a witness of the original text to the manuscript copies, almost all of which are older than the 16th century. Still more to the point, all, all printed copies have been made manuscript copies and therefore in the presence of the manuscripts themselves are mere repeaters of the witnesses and or no value at all as additional testimony to the original text. Where Ever the printed copies agree with the manuscripts they have been taken for them and add nothing to their testimony, they are conclusive witnesses wherever they represent readings that are found in the manuscript. This is due either to accidental error and is therefore of no value as testimony or to editorial amendations and represents therefore not a testament to what the original to New Testament contained but opinion as to what it must have contained. In no case, therefore, are printed copies available as witnesses, and the manuscript copies alone are treated as such. Alongside of the manuscripts, as the primary witness of the New Testament text may be placed, a secondary witness, translations of the Greek Testament into other languages. Although a version does not produce the text, but only the sense which the text conveys, yet, so far as it is an accurate rendering, we can reason back from the sense conveyed to the text that conveys it. No doubt we could not produce the text of the New Testament from versions alone, 
even though we could gain from them the entire sense of the volume. No doubt, too, the ability of aversion to witness on a special point will depend on the genius of the language into which the Greek has been transmuted. For example, the Latin can seldom testify to the presence or absence of the article, but in conjunction with Greek manuscripts and when regarded is paired to the limitations of the various tongues in which they exist, the testimony of versions may reach even primary importance in the case of all variations that affect the sense, especially in questions of insertion or omission of section clauses or words they may give no more uncertain voice than Greek manuscripts. For you as a witness to the text of the Greek New Testament, it is absolutely necessary that a version should have been made immediately from the Greek and not from another version. In the later case, it is a direct witness only to the text of the version from which it is made, and only in case of the loss of that variation can it be used as immediate witness to the Greek text. Furthermore, it is desirable that a version shall have been made sufficiently early for its witness to be borne to the Greek text of a time of which few monuments of it have come down to us. Ordinarily, a version is made from the Greek manuscript in current use at the time, and if this time be so late that we have the manuscripts themselves, the version runs to great risk of delivering simply collusive testimony like printed copies to be of much use in criticism. The English version, for example, although taken immediately from the Greek Tyndale in 1525 and repeatedly revised by the Greek since is of in appreciable, in appreciable value as a witness to the Greek text on account, on account of the lateness of its origin. The use of which a version may be put in textual criticism depends still further on the exactness with which it renders the Greek. A slavishness of literal rendering which should greatly lessen its usefulness as a version would give it only additional value as a witness to the Greek text. For example, the Heraclean Syriac version, which must have been a trial to the flesh of every Syrian reader who tried to make use of it, reads, reveals its underlying Greek text as perhaps no other ancient version is able to do so. Under such safeguards as these, the ancient immediate versions of the Greek Testament may be ranged alongside of the manuscripts as co-witness to its text. Still additional testimony can be obtained to the text of special passages of the Greek Testament by attending to the quotations made from the Greek Testament by those of use have written upon it. Whenever a reputable writer declares that his Greek Testament reads thus and thus, for as much of the text as it covers his assertion, is equal in value as a witness to a Greek manuscript of his day. And the ordinary quotation from the Greek Testament by early writers are, so far as they are accurately made, of real worth as a testimony to the text current in their time. As in the case of versions, uh, patristic evidence will vary in value with the age of the father who makes the quotation, with the accuracy with which he ordinarily quotes, and even with the character of the work in which the quotation occurs. For example, a citation in the polemic treatise bent mayhap to fit the need will be prima facie, prima facie less to be depended on in the minutiae of the wording than a lengthy quotation in the commentary copied out of the express purpose of explaining its very word. So far, however, as this patristic evidence is available at all and can be depended on its direct evidence as distinguished from indirect character of the evidence of translations and cannot be neglected without serious loss. The collection of the evidence for the text of the New Testament includes thus the gathering together of all the manuscripts of the New Testament of all the ancient immediate translations made from it and of all citations taken from it by early writers, the comparing of all these together and noting of their divergent and various readings and the attaching to each various readings the list of witnesses that support it. The labourer required for such a task depends of course on the wealth of the witnessing documents that exist and need examining or collating as it technically called. If, for instance, we were dealing with the first six books of the Annals of Tacitus, the task would be an easy one. There would be but a single manuscript to examine, no version, and before the 15th century, but a single quotation. The New Testament, on the other hand, the number of no manuscripts cannot fall below 2,000. At least a dozen early versions must be taken account of, and the whole mass of patristic literature must be searched for quotations. 
and the annals of Tacitus again as we have but a single manuscript and nothing to collate with it we should have no various readings at all while in the New Testament we must needs first before the work of collation is more than half completed none the less than 200,000 whence it is easy to see we may remark in passing that this great number of various readings is not due to greater corruption of the New Testament text than is ordinarily found in ancient writings but to the immensely greater number of witnessing documents that have come down to us for it over and above what is reached us for any other ancient work whatsoever it also immediately apparent however that no one man and no one generation could hope to bring to completion the task of collecting the various reading New Testament with full evidence for each as a matter of fact this work has been performing now by a succession of diligent and self-denying scholars since the undertaking of Walton's polygot in 1657 already in Mill's day 1707 as many as 30,000 various readings had been collected and from Bentley and Wenstein to Tischendorf Tregels and Scrivener the work has been prosecuted without intermission until it now has reached relative completeness and the time is ripe for the estimation of the great mass of evidence that has been gathered it must not be inferred from this that all the known manuscripts of the New Testament have yet been collated only a small minority of the whole number have been accurately examined much less entirely collated and every year additions are made to the mass of facts already known but now at length enough have been collated to give us knowledge of the general character of the whole and to place the testimony of all the old most valuable in detail before our eyes the scholars of today while beckoned on by example of the great collators of the past to continue uh, to continue the work of gathering material as strength and opportunity may allow yet enters into a great inheritance of work already done and is able to undertake the work of textual criticism itself as distinguished from the collecting of material for that work results of collation that were made before the publication of those great works have been collected and spread ordinary, ordinarily for the eye of the student of the critical edition of the Greek New Testament edited by Dr. Tregels and Dr. Tischendorf with the digest of readings given in these works the beginner may well content himself he would discover later that such digests have not been framed or printed without some petty errors or detail creeping in and will learn to correct these and add the results of more recent collations but he will understand more and more full every year that, that he prosecutes his studies what monuments of diligence and painstaking care these digests are and how indispensable they are for a future work every student who proposes to devote any considerable time to the study of this branch of sacred learning should procure at the outset either Dr. Tregel's Greek New Testament edited from ancient authorities with various readings in full or Dr. Tischendorf's uh, minor edition uh, contains an excellent uh, compressed digest and will suffice for the needs of those who can ill afford the large edition or who could, pu or who could put up little time on the study of this subject one or, one or other of these three editions is however a little less than a necessary prerequisite for the profitable study of textual criticism Greek manuscripts of the New Testament the most astonishing thing about the manuscripts of the New Testament is their great number has already been intimated quite 2,000 of them have been catalogued upon the list it's now 5,000 a number altogether out of proportion to what antiquity has preserved for other ancient books the oldest of them was written about the middle of the fourth century the youngest after the New Testament had been put into print the products of so many ages they differ among themselves in numerous particulars the material in which they are written, the character in which they are written, the divisions have been introduced into the text or indicated on the margin, the punctuation they have received and the like. The oldest copy that has survived to our day, it will be observed, was made quite centuries or two centuries and a half after the latest book of the New Testament was given to the world. There can arise no question among them, therefore, as to the autographs of the sacred books. 
However, we may account for it. The Autobach, Autogast disappeared very early, perhaps. Uh, the brittleness of the papyri in John 2, 2 John 12, on which they were written, and the constant use to which they were put, combined with the evil fortunes of a persecuted church and a piety which knew nothing of the sacredness of relics to destroy them very rapidly. At any rate, except in rhetorical bursts of a Tertullian, we hear nothing of them in the primitive church, and in Irenaeus and an origin where, like us of today, forced to depend solely on the oldest and more accurate copies. In attempting to classify this vast material, the first and sharpest line that is drawn concerning itself with the Conta manuscript and separate, separates those which give a continuous text of whatever extent for those that contain only church lessons drawn from the New Testament. The later are called lectionaries and number several thousand dating from the 8th to the 16th and, each, and even 17th centuries. They form a subordinate class of manuscripts which will engage our attention at a later point. The continuous manuscripts are much more numerous but differ greatly among themselves in the extent of their contents. Only a few contain the whole New Testament and some are small fragments that preserve only a few verses or even words. Most of them doubtless never contain the entire New Testament, but were then complete manuscripts or of one or more of the portions into which the bulkiness of a written copy and the costliness of the handmade volumes caused the New Testament to be divided in early times. This circumstance leads to the apportionment of our extant manuscripts into classes. According to the parts of the New Testament, they contain, and following the indications of the early custom, the New Testament is divided for critical purposes into four sections. The Gospels, the Acts and Catholic Epistles, the Epistles of Paul, the Apocalypse. The manuscripts for each of these sections are counted separately and symbols assigned to them independently. It hence happens that when a manuscript contains more than one section, it may be represented by different symbols in its several parts, while conversely the same symbol may represent different manuscripts in several sections. Thus, for example, D in the Gospels is Codex Beza, while D in Paul is Codex uh, Clalomantanus, a related but entirely different manuscript. B in the Gospels is the great Codex Vaticanus, the oldest and most valuable of our manuscripts, while BL uh, LN, the Apocalypse, is the late and inferior Codex Vaticanus 2066. On the other hand, A of the Gospels is the same Codex as G in Paul, and 13 of the Acts is the, of the same, 33 of the Gospels, and 17 of Paul, 69 of Gospels in the same, as 31 of Acts, 37 of Paul, and 14 of the Apocalypse. On the other hand, NAC represents the same codices throughout the four parts, one, three, five, six, etc., are the same codices in the Gospels, Acts, and Paul. The list for each of the four parts is redacted in word in entire independence of others and must be treated independently. The conveniences that arise from this arrangement are manifold by a very small inconvenience result, except when we wish to speak of a manuscript in a context that gives no hint of, of the portion of the New Testament which it belongs. Usually it is easy to use its name in such cases when this is inconvenient. A kind of shorthand method of distinguishing it has been suggested which consists in placing a small numeral at the bottom, not at the top, um, like uh, likes an exponent. This means something very different of the symbol designating at it as the second, third or fourth manuscript of that symbol in the list. The parts being counted, of course, from the Gospels on thus D without numeral, numeral means Codex Beza, which contains the Gospels and Acts, and D two Codex Claremontanus, which contains the Epistles of Paul. In like manner, E means Codex Basilinsis of the Gospels, while E two means Codex Laudanus thirty five of the Acts, and E J Codex Sangamensis. Manensis of Paul, or again B is the great codex Vaticanus and concludes as the Gospel Acts Paul, while B2 is codex Vaticanus 2066 and contains the Apocalypse 
Another method of somewhat more clumsily securing the same results is to place at the top of the symbol an abbreviated indication of the portion of the New Testament in which the manuscript bears the symbol thus B A P O C P U at or D P A U I and the L J J J G. No such distinguishing marks are needed in citing the manuscripts in the direct business of textual criticism, for which purpose their classification and symbolizing were invented. The passage that is under discussion determines the section and the verse symbol is sufficient to identify the manuscript. Another sharp division line that separates the manuscripts into great, into great well marked classes concerns itself with the character of handwriting in which they are written. By this division, the manuscripts are parted into two very unequal bodies called respectively unical MS and minuscule or more improperly conf comfort using, usingly cursive MS. The former includes all, includes all the manuscripts less than 100 in number which are written throughout in that kind of half capital character which is technically known as a, a, un, a unical. They are designed in the list and cited in the digest by the capital letters of Latin, Greek, Hebrew, etc. So I'm going to close there on that and I'm going to read the history of textual criticism now because uh, it's obviously very technical and so I would encourage you to go and read the book it's called An Introduction to Textual Criticism by B. 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 Warfield. Uh, I'm going to be reading finishing it off tonight. Um, so we're going to just look at the history of criticism. Okay. So we're going to look at the history of textual criticism. All right. He goes, the history of the earlier periods of the text of the New Testament is naturally enough a history of progressive corruption. The multiplication of copies was the chief concern of an ever increasing body of readers and though we early hear complaints of corruption as well we might from the rapidly with which corruption seems to have grown and from the grossness of the corruptions which found their way particularly into the Gospels we hear a little serious effort to secure a correct text. Nevertheless, the earliest fathers showed themselves in some sense guardians of the text and ready to distinguish between the common and the best and oldest copies. The autographs of the sacred writings disappeared exceedingly early and Irenaeus and Origen were already without appeal to aught but the more accurate copies. Already by the time the cur current type of text had long been that which is now known as the Western and which attained early in the second century the position and circulation of a virtual text of receptors and retained this position for about two centuries. A purer and more carefully guarded text was nevertheless throughout this whole period in use in various places, apparently most commonly at Alexandria. I uh, uh, disagree with you there, B.B. Waffle. Where also in one line of its transmission it suffered before the middle of the third century. I think the Alexandrian is more just an aside. I think the Alexandrian actually is more fluid and not as accurate as the Byzantine side. Sorry, BB, I disagree with you. You see, uh, so he goes, We're also in one line of transmission. It suffered before the middle of the third century sufficient deflection from the absolute standard to give rise to another strongly marked type of text, which is now called the Alexandrian. Tradition has not handed down to us accounts of any very early attempt to provide a standard edition. Although Jerome tells us that Origen in Palestine, Lucian at Antioch, and Hestius in Egypt each revised the text of the New Testament, as well as that of the Greek Old Testament. It is not clear how much dependence can be placed on this statement, which is not free from difficulties. The scribes give us occasional notes which betray a belief in the existence of something like a standard copy in the library of the holy martyr Pamphilius at Caesarea. The conformity with which was the norm of correctness, but if they know nothing but this fact. Nevertheless, the more unmistakable evidence of the textual 
remains that have come down to us prove that at least one set revision of text was made in Syria and probably at Antioch at about that time that would fall in the period of Lucian's activity. The object of this revision, the earliest attempt to issue a critical edition of the New Testament text of which we can be sure, and of which we possess documentary knowledge, seems to have been to furnish for the use of the Syrian churches a sound substitute for the very corrupt Western text which had for so long held the ground. The revision was held well done for the purpose in view and for the times it is an honor to the scholarship and good sorry the revision was well done for the purpose in view and for the time it is an honor to the scholarship and good judgment of the school of Antioch and presents characteristics quite in keeping with the exegetical reputation, reputation of that school. It was impossible at the time and under the ruling views of criticism to form sound text. But these scholars succeed in substituting popular use for the exceedingly corrupt textus receptus, then current a text free from all the gross corruptions that disfigured it, smooth and readable in structure and completely exact for all practical purposes. Just a little on the side here, uh, notice that he says the Lucian school were, were quite accurate. That's the text. That's the text that came through the Byzantine. That's the text that goes into the King James version. Just a little aside there. He goes, the Christian world, which has been the heir of their labours for a millennium and a half, owes a debt of thanks to Superintendent Providence for the good work done thus in the corner, and probably with only a local intent. For this. Scholars of Antioch were in God's in a greater work than they knew. Soon the persecutions of the dying heathen broke out with redoubled fury, and everywhere Christian books were sought and destroyed. Then came Constantine of the Christian Empire, established with its seat uh, the Bosphorus, and Antioch became an ecclesiastically the mother of Constantinople. And the revised text of Antioch, the ecclesiastical text of the center of the world, the preparation of the magnificent copies of scripture ordered by Constantin Constantino for churches of Constantinople was entrusted to Eusebius of Caesarea, whose affiliations were with Antioch, and everywhere the Syrian text began to make its way. The separation of the Eastern and Western empires was followed by the separation of the Eastern and Western churches, with the effect of confining the use of Greek to narrow limits and giving increased power to the Constantinople tradition. Wherever the Greek scriptures were used, though some serious alterations were suffered by it in the process of time, it was thus the Constantinopian text that became the text of the Greek world. And with the revival of Greek letters in the West under the teaching of Byzantine refugees of the whole world, how the process of substitution took place, it is not necessary to trace. Sometimes it was, no doubt, by direct importation of copies from the capital. At others, it was by the correction of copies of other types by Syrian models, which secured that the descendants should be Syrian. Thus, Codex E of Paul is largely Syrian, although it is a copy of the purely Western D, and thus too properly, probably is to be the explainer that Codex A and the other Gospels is Syrian, while in Mark it remains mostly pre-Syrian. The great popularity of the Antiochian exegetes and of the homilies of such orators as Chrysostom carried with it preference to preference to their text. What effect on this process the addition, excuse me, of Altheus had in the last half of the fifth century, which was rather a handy addition than a purified text, it is impossible to determine. At all events, traces of other texts became rarer and rarer as times passed, although mixed texts were exceedingly abundant at first. Even these gradually gave way, and throughout the Middle Ages, and down to the invention of printing, the Syrian text reigned everywhere, as indisputably the received text of the Church Universal, as the Western text had been from the 2nd to the 4th century. The passing of a text through printing press has no tendency to revise it. The first printed Greek Testament was that included in the com plantation polygot and is dated 1514 but as its issue was delayed the first published Greek testament was Erasmus first edition published by Forbin at Bale in 1516 hurried through the press at breakneck speed in the effort to forestall the comp 
Pluton com Plutensian polygot. It was taken from late and almost contemporary manuscripts and mirrored the state of the received text of the time. It bore indeed sundry printers boss on its title page, but its editor felt free to say in private that it was uh, precipitum various quam edum. Uh, the Complutinian itself, when it did appear in 1520, proved to have been made as was natural from older manuscripts of the same type, and thus the printed text of the New Testament simply continued the history of the written text, leaving its character and change gave it only a new mode of reproduction. <laughs> the normal history that is worked out by the printed text or of any work which has previously been propagated for a long time in a manuscript is something like this. The first edition is taken from the manuscript nearest at hand and some one edition gains such a circulation and acceptance usually from its convenience or beauty as to become the standard. And thus also the received text and then eff efforts were made critically to restore the text to its original purity. Just this history has been wrought out by the New Testament text. The editions immediately succeeding those of Erasmus differed little in detail and nothing in type from the text he published, but the magnificence of Stephen's Edito Regirio in, Regiria in 1515, and the convenience and beauty of the small Elisivers, especially those of 1624 and 1633, enabled these editions to determine the standard text, the one for English and the other for continental readers. Reverence for the Word of God, perversely but not unnatural, actually exercised, directed that it received text into the norm of a true text, and although preparation for critical edition began very early and was seriously undertaken by the editors of Walton Polygot in 1657, yet many years passed away before the hardened bondage to the received text could be shaken. It was not until 1831 that it was entirely broken by the issue of Latchman's first edition. The history of the edition from edition from 1657 therefore falls into two periods. The one containing the editions which were striving to be rid of the bondage of the received text from 1657 to 1831 and the other those which have been framed in conscious emancipation from it from 1831 until our own day. During the former period the task men set before them was to correct the received text as far as the evidence absolutely compelled correction. During the later the task has been to, to the best attainable text from the concurrence of the best evidence. The chief editions of the former period were those of Walton Polygot, 1657, John Fell, 1695, John Mill, 1707, Wells, 1709, 19, Bentley, 9, 1720, Bengal, 1734, Westine, 1751 to 2, Greisbach, 1775 to 1807, Mathsai, 782-82 Schultz, 1830-36. Uh, the chief edition of the later period have been those of Latchman, 1831, especially 1842-50, and Tischendorf, 1840-72, especially his eighth critical edition, published in part since 1864-1872. to Traggles in part from 1857-1879 to 1879 and West Scott and Hall in 1881. In one way or other, the sequence of these editions marks a continuous advance, although in special points and eddying out and then sets backwards. For in instance, West, Westine, Mathsai, and Schultz all marked a retrograde, move, retrograde movement in principle of criticism and in the text actually set forth, but each advance in the collection of the materials for framing the text. It would be desirable, therefore, to print present the history of criticism briefly under four heads, including the collection of the documentary evidence of the text, the classification of this ever-increasing material, the formation of critical rules for the application of the evidence in reconstructing the text, the actual formation of the text. The work of collecting the material heralded by Stevens and uh, Beza was commenced in earnest by Walton's Polygot in 16 
The great names of this work include those of Archbishop Usher, Bishop Val Mill, already could appeal to this 30,000 various readings, Bentley and those in the employment. Just an aside, uh, Bart Herman, when he's talking about textual criticism in his books, he often mentioned Mill. He often pull out one or two of his favorite textual critics in history. And basically, he leaves a lot of names out. He leaves some many of these names out. Many of these names were people of giant stature in textual criticism, and they were believers in the Bible as inspired, such as Beza, Stevens, Tischendorf, Dean Bergen, Scrivener, etc. Archbishop Usher, etc. Okay? Mathai and Birch, Alter, uh, Greisbach, Salz, Tischendorf, uh, whose editions of MS exceeded in number of all that had been put forth before him. Tregels and Scrivener, with whom may be also named Dean Bergen, until Tischendorf's labors were undertaken, a satisfactory edition of the New Testament was impossible. If for no other reason than insufficient knowledge of the testimony, how practically all the unicals and a large body of the mun municipals are, are accurately known and have been introduced in the digest and was not published until 1862, no satisfactory edition of B existed until 1868, QD, NP, EZ, LHEP, 2 have all been issued since 1843, 2 was not discovered until 1879, and WG not until 1881. The versions are not even yet critically edited, but we have at last attained the position of having evidence enough before us to render the sketching of the history of the text possible, and to certify us that new discoveries will only enlighten darkened places and not overturn the whole fabric. It was inevitable that in the first youth of textual criticism, all documents should be treated as practically of equal value. We cannot blame Erasmus, that he set aside the only good MS he had because it differed so much from the others. Nor is it difficult to see why the collations of Stefan and others early edis edition editors rather ornamented their margins than amended the text. By Mill's time of 1707, however, enough material was collected for some signs of classification to be dimly seen. Bentley in 1662 and 1742 profited by his hints and perceive the great division line that runs between the old and the late codices, especially speaking between the pre-Syrian and Syrian John Albrecht Bengel, uh, 1687 and 1652, was the first, however, to do a great work in this department of investigation. Just an aside, he was a great Christian scholar. Doesn't get much mentioned by Bart Ehrman. His acuteness perceived the advantages of a genealogical classification and his diligence worked out the main out outlines of a true distribution. Like Bentley, he drew a broad line of demarcation between the ancient and more modern copies, which he classified under the names of the African Asiatic families, and then he made the new step of dividing in a more or less firm manner the African family itself into two sub-tribes represented respectively by A, the only purely Greek unicles at the time in use, and the old Latin versions. He held the African class to be the more valuable, and it was a critical rule with him that no reading of the Asiatic class was likely to be genuine unless supported by some African document. Similar, similar in 1764 followed and handed down Bengal's classification to the greater Greisbach, 1745. Greisbach divided all, all documents into three classes with all respectively. So, a little bit of, of history about textual criticism there, uh, some issues about criti textual criticism. I know it's kind of, kind of quite technical for you, um, but I enjoyed it, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it too. And um, if it's too difficult for you, don't worry. Go and read the book, Introduction to Textual Criticism by B.B. Warfield. God bless you and thank you for listening and take care.